Mr. President, Ray McGovern is here to brief you. Oh, yeah, Ray. Tell me about the, all the bad news. Uh, Good morning, Mr. President. I'm glad you're back from Germany. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to start with uh, something that has been widely quoted. Uh, well, you were at Schönefeld, the airport, uh, just before departure. Uh, you told the press in answer to a question. Well, the question was, do you know what Netanyahu is going to do in response to the October 1 Iranian attacks? And do you know when he's going to do it? And you said, yes, and yes. Um, now, that's been given pretty wide play. So I guess I just want to impress upon you that uh, whatever Netanyahu does, uh, most people will, will think that not only did you know about it, but you had specifics about the timing of it. On the same day, Mr. President, this has been pretty much... Uh, submerged in the media, the establishment media. But on the same day, there was a very, very important leak of sensitive information, intelligence on uh, Netanyahu's and Israel's preparations to attack Iran. It happened about the same time that you made that, that statement in Schoenefeld. Uh, I don't know if there's any connection at all, but somebody leaked a very sensitive sensitive two documents from dated October 16th, so two days before, and it is a, an incredibly detailed array of monitoring of the, or what the Israelis are doing based on mostly on U.S. satellite intelligence, other intelligence crammed in there, and it's shared with the Brits and, of course, uh, with, the, with the five eyes, that's the Brits, Canadians, Australians, New Zealand's and Canada. So this is open now. Uh, again, the press is being very coy about it. They don't want to say anything that's classified, uh, even though the Ellsberg case and the New York Times case uh, succeeded in, in asserting that the, uh, the mainstream press can do can publish these things. But they're not touching. They're just says, referring to it there and there. But it's out there chapter and verse. So what I'm saying is that uh, when it comes, if it comes, uh, the people will know not only that you, you, you said you'd know about it and the timing, but also there's mention in there about Israeli nuclear weapons uh, with the missiles. And the expression there is, gosh, they, they haven't moved them, thank God. You know, they, they're not, not going to use the nuclear stuff. And there's also so that very damaging detail in there. So at work, our guess is that some whistleblower decided that he or she wanted to stop a world war. Huh? And uh, yeah, you'll remember that uh, Mr. Ellsberg uh, kept saying, look, don't wait. Don't, don't do what I did. Wait until 1971 to divulge these things. Do it before the bombs start falling. So this person or persons did this. God knows what else they've done. Uh, we know what they've released so far. And, uh, you know, there's a danger that uh, Netanyahu will think that, well, maybe somebody within the U.S. administration leaked this deliberately, and that may, may enhance his readiness to go ahead and shoot off uh, quickly before anybody has, has a chance to remonstrate. Uh, there are a couple other details about the thing that uh, are pretty embarrassing. Uh, you know, the five eyes are the ones I mentioned, the, the people who are sharing SIGINT, signals intelligence, since World War II. And, uh, you know, distinctively, they're all white. Uh, and, you know, when you put them together with Israel, you've got, you know, six white nations against the rest of the world, pretty much. And the rest of the world is convening in Kazan, Russia, tomorrow for the BRICS meeting. So the contrast there is pretty stark. And Mr. President, uh, there's nothing anyone can do about the fact that the whites are in the minority and the, uh, the people of color, including the global south, uh, are uh, burgeoning in strength, uh, despite uh, what you have said often about 
this is not going to happen on your watch. Well, it is, and uh, you should know that just in case it comes up in the next two weeks. What good is knowing it? You think I can control Netanyahu? You got, well, he's got us by the short hairs, Ray. You've yeah. been in this business, what, 27 years? No well, president, no president yeah. has been as much under the control of an ally as Netanyahu is doing right now to, to me. He knows Trump is just waiting for something to come up where he can blast Kamala uh, as weak on, on Israel and then uh, somehow save his ass. You know, uh, Trump has no reservation about that. He'd probably say he'd nuke Lebanon or something like that. And we're trying to save the world here. Netanyahu goes and attacks what is probably the most respected country in the Mideast out of his, outside of Israel, Lebanon, you know, uh, uh, and a country that's got a lot of different people living there, different religions, different history, and uh, he, he's got us. And I'm, I'm just hoping uh, he, can't, he doesn't do anything uh, before the election because he could no. really own this election. And the other thing is, if he goes ahead and attacks Iran, and this is something you know better than anybody, and they go start hitting their, their oil fields or Iran hits other oil fields, who's the big winner? You know who the big winner is? Putin. Putin. Suddenly, you know, you can't get the oil from the Mideast to India, to China, anywhere. You can't go anywhere. And, uh, you know, Ray, you know this better than I do. Uh, how the hell am I supposed to be saving the Ukraine and they would give Putin the biggest gift they could give him if they go mm -hmm. messing up Iranian oil and then Iran messes up, what, Saudi oil? Well, it's all over. Yeah, well, Mr. President... And you uh, think Netanyahu gives a damn? He don't give a damn. He don't give a damn. He's, and, and he's worried if, if Kamala wins, maybe he can't control her as easier as he can Trump because Trump is... You know, hey, whatever you want, right? Yeah, Mr. President, uh, last time we spoke, uh, you used an expression uh, uh, that uh, Netanyahu has us by the short hairs. Uh, you're quite right about that. The question is uh, what he'll do uh, in the knowledge or in the belief that that's the situation. So you talked about the next two weeks. Of course, uh, two weeks from tomorrow is the election. Will he attack Iran before the election? And will you be required to either support that or not support it? Well, he's got you between the rock and a hard place. And I think, and we think, there's all the very all likelihood that he will indeed attack Iran in retaliation for the October 1st attacks by Iran before the election. And that will put you in the very embarrassing place of already having said, yeah, you know what he's going to do, and you know when he's going to do it, you will, you will have no option other than to, well, you'll have no option in the political sense as to do anything other than support him 150%. In, in the strategic sense, Mr. President, you still have options. You could say no. And most of the world realizes that. Most of the world realizes you've got a domestic political problem. Uh, they don't understand how important that is in this local domestic setting, and they expect you to rein in Netanyahu, but you have already said, no, no, you know what he's going to do, and when he's going to do it. Now, this leak may put the brakes on Netanyahu, uh, because, you know, it's terribly detailed. It's very useful to the Iranians. They know what's being readied. They know that nukes are not being readied. And in mentioning nukes, I have to say, Mr. President, that the Iranians can go to nukes in very short order. A couple of weeks, probably, they're probably already working on, on the material and the, the capsule that would be needed to put on these, uh, on these uh, missiles. And so you're gonna, it's going to be a nuclear Iran, whether or not Netanyahu attacks the Iranian nuclear 
sites, which are heavily buried under the ground. So uh, in sum, uh, Israel is proceeding on the assumption that you are with it for bore. They think chances are really good over the next two weeks that you will have no other option than to support them fully. They're preparing. Everyone knows that we have extensive, detailed information on their preparations. When they hit, it will be a really tough situation for you, Mr. President, because if you if you think we have you have no option other than support him, well, you're sort of you'll be complicit in the eyes of the world, complicit in this, and in the eyes of Iran. Uh, you know, I would not rule out they're using their proxies in Iraq or Syria to attack those thousands of U.S. troops that we still have there for whatever reason, or uh, attack other uh, U.S. bases in the area. In other words, they have they would have reason to justify that by virtue of your admission that you know what's going to happen and you know when it's going to happen. So what do I do about it, Ray? I've well, been talking to you for decades now, one way or another, you know, you're a smart guy and everything. But if, if Netanyahu does it, what am I going to do? There well, are, they goes into Iran. And, and what do I do in the days before an election? I, I, I break with him. Uh, did you see the way that Republicans in Congress greeted him? With, what was it? 55 uh, standing ovations? And they got yeah. plenty of Democrats on their side, yeah. uh, you know. And you think what? What Ray? What? What do you think? You think well, I think gonna, Mr. you're gonna in the middle of a war with Iran. I'm gonna tell, say that I'm not backing Netanyahu. What? what, what Mr. What, President, as I've suggested, be before. alive and Kamala yeah. would be finished and Trump would be president. And then he'd probably mm -hmm. put me under house arrest or something. You know, Mr. even President, also the White House. He'd probably do it even before he takes office, you know. Mr. President, uh, Netanyahu has not attacked Iran yet. Uh, that gives you a little space to intervene. And the west best way to do that, as I've suggested before, is to take advantage of the fact that his military doesn't want any part of this. They know they're overextended. And our military, if I read it right, is very cherry about getting involved in the Third World War. You yourself has said you don't want a third world war. So what can happen? Well, uh, Secretary Austin, when he gets finished with Zelensky today, uh, can call up uh, his opposite number, Gallant, in Israel and say, look, we are advising the, our president uh, not to condone major war, a regional war. So we don't want you to head out. Uh, at Iran, as you seem to be willing to do, and we have extensive intelligence on it before the election. Can you do that? And his opposite number will say, well, I don't know. Uh, we don't want a war either, but I don't know if we can dissuade Netanyahu. That's the, the wild card here. The, the Israeli military doesn't want to get involved in a war. They want to keep their Jupiter missiles with their nuclear warheads safe. And they don't want the retaliation that Iran has already demonstrated twice now that they can get through uh, Israeli air defenses and kind of do, do what they want in terms of hitting airfields and even population centers if they so choose. So this is the breathing time you have. It might be just a day. It might be two days. But you have to weigh, in my view, uh, the the merits of of having that kind of intervention, whether it succeeds or not, and just doing nothing and, and let it happen, and that will happen before the election. Lots of things are going to happen before the election. None of it very good for um, uh, for Vice President Harris, but there's a way to head it off. And it would be for you to, to get on the phone or to get uh, Austin on the phone, not Blinken. Blinken is Netanyahu's lawyer, for God's sake. Put Austin on the phone to his opposite number and tell him, look, we're against it. We're not going to support it, uh, particularly if you do it in the next two weeks. Yeah. Have you, you don't brief Kamala. Uh, my, my, my colleagues do, yeah. yeah my does colleagues she do. know? Anything? I mean, I can't. I don't know what's going on. They don't even let me talk to her much. You know, I don't know. Uh, 
What, what, what does she think? She hasn't said anything. She yes. said something there the other day, Saturday, yeah. Some heckler wearing a Palestinian scarf. He said he was shouting at her about genocide. She yeah. said something about, uh, well, yeah, this is not the forum for it. Uh, was I don't know why it wasn't the forum. It's Wisconsin primary. You could, uh, that's a new one. But still, she he, she said this is not. But I hear you, and and uh, that, that's a real concern. She seemed to accept that maybe what the U.S. doing supporting genocide. I don't know. I, I the people tell me she was misquoted. I don't know. Well, you know, you know anything about that, or your colleague? Have, we have watched that. Um, we need to watch that, of course, from our side. Um, what we don't understand is why when she goes out to these battleground states there in the Midwest, uh, even speaking before heavily Palestinian audiences, uh, she goes back and always refers to, to October 7th as having been responsible for all this October 7th, this terrible attack. Whereas the Palestinians know full well this goes back to 1948 this kind of oppression. So she's not winning any votes there. So that's all I can say about that because this is domestic politics and uh, uh, we're just yeah. kind of observers here. But she's saying pretty much what you're saying. And uh, if Trump is able to pro project himself as the peace president, the peace candidate, you know, and he's been able to convince a lot of people that he would end the war in Ukraine. And uh, he hasn't said much about uh, about Israel, he would, for, of course, support them full bore. But Ukraine, that's a winner for him, in my view. And uh, we could uh, we could talk about Ukraine when, when you have... Uh, unless well, that's another thing I wanted to ask you. I mean, uh, I can't believe what's happening with Ukraine. That was supposed to be our winner. Here we are, you know, we're supposed to be... Trump is the agent to Putin. He's a, you know, you can't call him a communist or something but uh you know he's, he's they got something on him that's what we've been saying and then here's putin he seems to think that issue is going to play well for him right he's he says he's going to end that war and then we got this real problem here with uh, Zelensky saying he wants victory but we got to put him in nato and we got to let him attack the heartland of russia or something that ain't going to happen and uh what 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 do we do here? How did this go to be so, get to be such a loser, Ray? Now I know you've had some warnings about that, but what the hell is going on? I mean, uh, can't we stabilize it or what? Well, before I forget to to mention this, Mr. President, of course, uh, Secretary Austin is meeting with, or probably has already met with Zelensky. I don't know if you've had any readout from that from that meeting, but there is an opportunity to speak some sense to him uh, and to people like his own briefer in the Pentagon. Uh, this fellow General Ryder, uh, thinking about ghost writers in the sky, he's an Air Force General, right? And, and what he says was, and this was just Friday, Russia is, quote, desperate. In a dire situation, Russia is running out of troops in Ukraine, period, end quote. He said that at a Pentagon briefing, a formal briefing he gave to the media. I don't know what planet this Air Force general is coming from, but he's your spokesman or the Pentagon's spokesman. It sounds very much like what uh, what Bill Burns told you to say back in July of last year, Putin has already lost. Uh, his military has been shown up as being just not, not very good at all. They have a strategic defeat on their hands. So again, Mr. President, you referred to the fact that we have a different story in the CIA. This is not the first time we had a different story on Vietnam as well, but politics comes into this and also kind of delusional thinking. I don't know who told uh, your Pentagon spokesman to say uh, that uh, 
that Russia is desperate and in a dire situation and running out of troops in Ukraine. It's just the opposite, Mr. President. So it seems to me that uh, these people need to be uh, kind of uh, re-educated to the reality that we've been mentioning for months and months and months. And to give the Americans the idea that there's still a, a possibility in the next two weeks that uh, Russia will be defeated and Ukraine prevail, well, that's not even going to work for two weeks. Here's an example. We talked earlier about, that, that is a couple of times ago, about David Ignatius, who is a Washington Post ace reporter. He very often uh, conveys information from the intelligence community and from the Pentagon. And here's what he has today. He's talking about Zelensky, right? And he's talking about the new defense minister, Umerov, who is uh, supposed to be a real crackerjack guy. This is going to be better because he's a good defense minister. And he talks about three things. Uh, what Ukraine wants is a quick invitation to join NATO after the war. <laughs> after the war. Okay. Now, Blinken and all your other people have been saying, now, joining NATO for Ukraine is, uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's a sure thing. What's the word used? Uh, uh, I'll, fin I'll fin remember it in a second. Uh, then the second thing is, uh, here's uh, Ignatius saying that uh, deep strikes on military targets in Russia to prevent it from attacking civilians and critical infrastructure in Ukraine. Well, if memory serves, on the 13th of September, you ruled that out. So here's Ignatius repeating this hope by Umerov and the, and the Ukrainians and many of your own neocon advisors that you'll reverse that. And third and last, uh, what Umerov is saying, according to Ignatius, is we just have to hold a line. Just hold a line for a while longer. Read Two more weeks, and then, as Austin is reported to have been saying to Zelensky today, we will assure that U.S. and Western support will continue. You know, if Zelensky is not smart enough to see through that, I don't know what. And what I fear, and what we fear, is that he'll, he's very desperate. He's the one that's desperate. He's going to do some sort of really ridiculous thing within the next two weeks, to solidify his position and try to reverse this inevitable, inevitable decline. What's the word? Uh, I'm still searching for that word that, that Blinken uses and NATO, NATO uses. Uh, ir, it will never be reversed, irreversible, or something like that. The entry of, uh, of Ukraine into NATO. Mr. President, that's the reason for the whole war and none other than the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, said that. He said, they asked us not to let Ukraine in NATO. We said no, and so he invaded Ukraine. Oh, ha, ha, he thought that was funny. I don't, we don't think that's funny. You have to deal with that within the next two weeks. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that Umerov and David Ignatius are able to hold the line in Ukraine for the next two weeks, much less the next two months. And of course, you will be in, in, in office until the 20th of January. All right, we're running out of time here. Look, uh, Ray, what's the uh, last thing here? What the hell is happening with this BRICS thing? They're uh, meeting in Russia now and uh, everybody's, what? I mean, we're supposed to have Putin isolated. He's supposed to not be selling his oil except some cheap price, you know, we were going to put that in. He was going to, you know, right, uh, have to suck up his own oil and everything. And now what? They're all meeting there. India, right? Brazil. What are all these? Uh, there's new countries going in there into that BRICS thing. Uh, what, what happened to the American century it, we, we've been talking about? It was not going to have another American century. But that, that sounds like defeatist talk but uh, what's going on why are they still meeting with putin they're not even supposed to be talking to him let alone paying for his war machine well oh, mr president straight i don't get it yeah mr president uh, whether it's defeatist talk or realistic talk that is the question now uh you have said many times that 
none of this is going to happen on your watch. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's not your fault, but these trends are inevitable. And with the war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza and now Lebanon, uh, pretty much blackening the, the reputation of our country, these people have full reign to rise up. And after all, Mr. President, I mentioned uh, the five eyes, right? All lily white countries and Israel, okay? Now, the world is divided in a very sinister way now between the whiteies and the rest of the world. And the rest of the world uh, represents a huge majority. China, India, parts of the, you just you just name it. So in BRICS, you have the personification, if you will, of how the trends in the world are going. Iran's a member, Saudi Arabia's a member. For God's sake, they're, they're keep, they have 30 people waiting to become members. So what, how to take account of that? Not to deny it, but to say, all right, well, is there a way we can cooperate with these people? Is there a way we can ensure the, the flow of oil? Is there a way that we can prevent, uh, you, uh, prevent Iran uh, from having to get involved in the kind of war that Russia and China are dead set against and that they will take measures not only to prevent, but if it happens, to make sure they come in and defend Iran and give it every every sense of support. So uh, the die is cast. It starts tomorrow. It goes for two days. Putin, uh, by happy circumstance for the Russians, is chair. It's happening in Kazan in, in Russia itself. People are congregating there. Uh, the pre-interviews by Lavrov, the foreign minister and others, uh, have been have been distinct for their their their, their self-assurance sounding the, the fact that look you know we're gonna push this we're not gonna push it but look what we have we have the majority here china and of course i just remind you one more time that putin just three weeks ago said our alliance with china is a military alliance it's alliance in every sense of the word uh, that's big and that's the new tectonic shift in our relationship. Not your fault. It's the fault of uh, lots of people who thought that they could play China off against Russia. The opposite has happened, and Ukraine has catalyzed this relationship so that it's, it's an alliance in, as Putin said, every sense of the word. Yeah, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be pushed aside soon, one way or another. It's amazing to me when those two countries, China is still a communist country, Vietnam is a communist country, Russia is supposed to be anti-communist. Putin, he, he, he turned against the communists, he defeated them in the election. Cold War is supposed to be over, we're supposed to be in charge. Now you got this BRICS meeting, all these people who are not supposed to get along, you know, Russia and Saudi Arabia, for God's sake, you know, uh, China, China and India, you know, all these people. Iran. What, 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 how the hell? Okay, I mean, we got to wind this up. But you didn't predict any of this. You guys at CIA, you told us, you told us there was an international communist movement, a timetable to take over the world, and we had to fight them. Now, they splintered. They splintered. There aren't two communist countries even on good talking terms, but somehow you got India talking to Russia, China talking to Russia. They don't seem to give a damn about this communism thing. We want Apple to move over to communist Vietnam, take business away from China. I don't know. I may be an old coot here, some people think, but how the hell did we get in this fix? We win the Cold War, and then they all get along, and they're trying to exclude us or screw us over by not using the dollar. That's the most treacherous damn thing that's happened in the whole post-war period. You attack the dollar, you got us by the throat. I can't print money to pay for all this crap we're paying for. How, how are we going to survive? We don't make anything anybody wants to buy anymore. The only thing is they need to use the dollar, whatever they buy. And now what? They're going to do trade without the dollar? That, that's the most dangerous subversion uh, it's terrible. 
right away. That's enough. You know, you got a 10 second answer that I can give you press <laughs> about all this in case someone well, asks. They don't ask me, that. How stupid. about 30 you know, seconds? The media, they're dumb. They don't even think to ask that question. That's a pretty good question to ask. I'd have a hard time. How did, it, if we won the Cold War, why are all these people now united to make it give us a hard time? I, I don't but, know the answer. Well, you got an answer? To a I do, answer? Mr. President. Yeah, yeah, this is a subject close to my heart because I've been evaluating uh, Sino Soviet and now Sino Russian relations for decades. Uh, you are quite right in remembering that in the 50s, it was the Sino Soviet bloc, okay? Communists united against the rest of the world, trying to take over the rest of the world. That ended with a dispute between these two giants. And they, they were at loggerheads shooting each other across their River Rhine borders, okay? And Nixon and Kissinger said, hey, we could take advantage of this. They did. They repaired relations with China, and Russia was really scared to death. They concluded arms control agreements with us, and things came down to a pretty nice pass until Ukraine. And when Ukraine went down... Uh, well, there's an old expression, Mr. President, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that's when Russia and China became the long ends of this isosceles triangle, where we're on the short end of the stick, they have gained power, and now have recruited the support of most of the rest of the world. Witness what's going on tomorrow in the BRICS meeting in Kazan, Russia. So... So Pelosi did it, right? When she went there over there to Taiwan, what the hell? Everybody blames me. They say I sent her. You ever try to stop Pelosi from doing something? She, I didn't know she was maybe just trying. She, I don't know what she was thinking. What, they got a bunch of voters there, old-time nationalists, Chinese, what, in San Francisco, Chinatown or something? She thought there were some votes she could get if she runs again for something. I don't know what. You know, but what the hell was, what was that about? We, you know, Nixon, you, you make Nixon sound like some kind of genius and you're making us, uh, uh, you know, you're making me look bad. I don't well, like the Chinese, to send us there, uh, Ray. Okay, you well, know, the Chinese uh, ask the same question about Pelosi. You know, why did you, this is a provocation, pure and simple. I mean, don't ask me to analyze Pelosi, except for the fact she had her son along uh, and he created some good business with the Chinese at the time. This was no secret at the time. So Pelosi is, is, is history, we hope. Um, I don't know how you prevent people from doing these kinds of things unless you just put your Yeah, but they're blaming it on me. They're saying well, I sent her. Yeah, you know, I didn't send her. And next thing I know, a whole bunch of these Congress people, they're going over there and, uh, you know, we've got to be arguing now about the Taiwan Strait. Yeah, you know, it's uh, unbelievable. All right, enough. Let's wrap it up there, right? Yeah, it's, I know. Uh -huh. I know you didn't make the problem. You know, I'll, uh, I'm not going to give you a recommendation for your next job. But, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 yeah, you're probably right on a lot of this stuff. You know, too late to do anything about it, you know. Uh, not too late, late on not too late with respect to Israel and Iran. Oh, yeah, the, the yeah, biggie. yeah. And you I got can just see the headline now. You know, I, I, you know, I betray Israel, yeah. And that, that's what Netanyahu wants. I play Is that Israel. worse? Mr. Yeah. Would that be worse than a, a full-fledged war in the region threatening to become a nuclear exchange between Israel and and yeah. what Iran may develop in terms of nuclear weapons. I don't know which is worse, but they could both happen before the election. Uh, I'm not a political observer of domestic politics, but those are the choices that I see them. Also, you have these three fronts, East Asia, the South China Sea, Taiwan Straits, South, uh, West Asia, and of course, Ukraine is going south real quickly no matter what the Pentagon spokesman talks about, Russia yeah. is not running out of Ray, I can't shut you up, you know. When, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you you got, look, I'm not going to put you down, though, because you've been dealing with this stuff forever. Uh, the only thing you don't get straight is you're not worried about 
who controls the White House and the Congress. We are two weeks away, two weeks away, Ray, from the biggest disaster, right? Uh, personal disaster. Look, I mean, we got what, 40 felonies against Trump? How many felonies is he going to get against me? Never hear the end of that, Barismo. What is that? How you pronounce it? Barisma? Bris- Barisma. Mm-hmm. Barisma, that Ukrainian damn thing. What the hell mm-hmm. was Hunter doing? No, don't quote me or anything like that on this ship. But what the hell was he doing? Going in there with that and getting a big job and making millions of bucks, you know. What, why didn't can somebody give him a job here, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> right? Couldn't he go work for Boeing or some shit like that? All right. <laughs> but enough of that. All right, Ray. See you next time if you... We're both still around. God damn, it's a terrible situation. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, no thanks.